Hi, my name is Mark Ward, Festival Programmer, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Redline Book Festival. The festival is brought to you by South Dublin Libraries and Arts. This event, Unshelled, features a brilliant panel of poets, including Sean Hewitt, Linda McKenna, and Kerry Hardy. Our moderator this evening is the inimitable Jessica Trainer. For full details on other events in our poetic license festival strand, check out redlinebookfestival.ie. And now, without further ado, Unshelled. Hello everybody and welcome to the Unshelved Poetry Reading as part of the Red Line Book Festival with poets Kerry Hardy, Sean Hewitt and Linda McKenna. Today we're going to be discussing three collections that have come out this year or are about to come out um, in the middle of this very, very strange year. Um, and I think many of us have turned to reading as one of the only true constants in this time of strange change. Um, and I think it's one of the only activities really that hasn't been impacted in quite the same way as many of the other artistic pursuits we turn to um, in strange and troubling times. Um, and in appreciation of this, uh, I'd like to encourage you all uh, to go out and buy the books from your independent booksellers. And um, I have Sean and Linda's here, Kerry's is forthcoming from Blood Axe uh, next month. Um, but please do try and buy them from your independent booksellers or direct from the publishers uh, or when the libraries are open, get back into the libraries and uh, get them through those routes, because I think these are all important things um, and they're all important parts of our lives, which have been, I suppose, taken away from us a little bit at the moment. Um, but we have a real treat for you today with three wonderful readers and three wonderful collections to discuss. Um, and I'd like to start by introducing the wonderful Kerry Hardy, whose eighth collection, Where Now Begins, is due from Blood X this November. She's published six collections with the Gallery Press before moving to Blood X, and her seventh collection, The Zebra Stood in the Night, was shortlisted for the Irish Times Award. She's won prizes in Ireland and internationally, and her work has been widely translated and anthologised. She's published two novels, a radio play with RTE, and is just completing another novel. She's a member of Astana. And today, I hope Kerry is going to read to us uh, from her wonderful new collection, Where Now Begins, which is a haunting and haunted collection that immerses us in the earthy now of rural contemporary life while interrogating the nature of lived time and experience. And I, for one, found these poems perfect uh, for our current autumnal October atmosphere. So Kerry, if you're ready, please do read us a few poems. I'd like to thank Thank Jessica and the Red Line Book Festival for giving me this opportunity to read these poems that are, will be published in my new book, which is due Um So, and since I haven't got the book in my hand, I'll read them from the page. The first poem that I want to read is, it's a sort of wet and wild poem it's a i mean it's it's a homage to the world and it's a it's an act of faith in the world that that we don't not that we don't destroy it but but it's a sort of it's a way of saying it's stronger than we think we it is him there is lush white rain pouring down on the june garden then the sun strikes through and I don't mind the ruin, the sodden poppies, geraniums, the irises, petunias, the roses mushed to a stew. Now everything's gone mad growing, especially the weeds, the hogwart, the nettles, the goose grass, the figwort. All that wild, sappy life growing stronger and fiercer, and me struggling to tame it over and over and failing to tame it over and over and as long as it always wins and i always lose there's a chance the next one is about that time um one of those times in your life when life hits you so hard that you feel as though all your resources have been used up um, they come back, you have to get up and do it again, but it's called Blasted. No roof to my house, empty stars, sea holly spiking the dunes. 
days reeling out, reeling in, black pines that groan in the light, the gut and rise of great waves, their splinter and smash on the sands. This one is about, it's called Bolt the Shutter, which is after the, the Yeats poem, um, Why Should Not All Men Be Mad? I, I, I looked in the mirror and for the first time I saw, I could see my great aunt and I could see my aunt. The face that looks from the mirror has the long boned jaw of my forebears. How age gives them access. They gaze, their eyes black with apprehension. Where are they saying when the heart of your flesh grows cold? Bare hills look out in answer, and the clean, empty skies of the morning. This one's called shopping. My mother-in-law had Alzheimer's, which is a progressive disease. So for a long time, she was just um, a bit mad and um, quite funny too. And and we were, she was on holiday with us once in Galway, and it's it's a dream I had of her when I remembered an actual incident in the dream. I remembered an actual incident that has happened. For no reason at all, I wrote, woke thinking about your mother. That last holiday in Galway, when she was going off and we were growing afraid. It was the shop I was remembering. The evening we went to buy ice cream. She wanted five family blocks, though she didn't like ice cream and neither did I, and the holiday house had no freezer. One block was more than enough. I Five of us in the house, she said. So one at a time, out five blocks, and then started wrapping them, hiding his doubt, block after block in yesterday's paper, while sea light poured in through the window, through the window, and lay across postcards and blackening bananas. And she kept insisting, and I kept saying no, till I gave up, gave in and started to laugh, and she's laughing too, and he's laughing with us, and filling my arms with ice cream, and we stumble out of the door and into the street smells, the seagulls, the salt air, fish frying. And I woke today, smiling all down the years, my arms full of melting vanilla. Civil War aftermath. Um, obviously, it's it's it refers to the North of Ireland, but also to the problems that every society faces after a civil war because they want to honour their dead, and what we need after a civil war is an act of collective forgetting. When they are together, now they bend to choose the small, flat, slaty stones from the damp sand and place them on their tongues and on their mouths, then lick the stones and suck where they gleam with blood and salt, then spit them on the wind. This is the salve they give one to another. This is a longer poem. Um, it's about watching a man. It's called Voyeur because I wanted to. It's a play on the title because I was a voyeur in this case and I was watching a man who, who clearly couldn't swim and yet he wanted to be in the sea. I'm sitting in the middle of a dune watching a squat man stand in a glitter of water. I think he is not a swimmer. Yet he wants to be there in the almonds of light as the low wave lips and turns over. Figures move over the strand, passing the small fat man who has walked far out on these long, smooth sands, then spread a green towel and undressed. It is hot and blue 
He wants to be deep in the water. He wades and stands, his ankles lost in the wash, surprised at his want, surprised at the feel of the water running in over his feet, the joy, as pleased and as lulled as a child who yearns for the mystery of the water. This swimming is a strange activity, as strange as fish longing, strange as this heat that's pasting butterflies onto white walls, spread leaves, and sends us now a man who stands alone in a brilliant sea. Yep, I think that's it. This is the last one. It's about what it's called, the title, Time Passing, Aging, Getting Used to Aging. I want to experience again the state where you're eaten alive by your own fierce lust for the world, but that's memory now and instead. The pigeons are blundering about playing flirt and chase in the ash, while the jackdaws drop sticks on the roof of the room where we waken from sleep to a kingdom of water and light, where the missile thrush hopping the grass stabs for worms and the songs he will fling from the poplars up there in the wind. And often the words that I need lie about in the piles of old rags on the cluttered floor of my mind, yet still the sweetness is here. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that, Terry. A beautiful reading and, and fabulously representative, I think, of the of the scope of the collection, which I know people are really going to love. Thank you so much. Um, turning to our next reader, Sean thank Hewitt. You. Um, thank you, Kerry. Uh, Sean Hewitt is a book critic for the Irish Times and a Government of Ireland Fellow at University College Cork. He won an Eric Gregory Award in 2019, the Resurgence Prize, now the Ginkgo Prize, in 2017, and a Northern Writers Award in 2016. His debut collection is Tongues of Fire from Jonathan Cape, 2020. So Sean is going to read a few poems from us uh, to us from this fantastic debut. <laughs> forges a new kind of eco-poetics shot through with joy, grief, sensuality and danger. So whenever you're ready, Sean, we'd love to hear some poems. Thank you very much. Uh, it's lovely to, to be here and have the opportunity to read with, um, with Linda and Kerry, two poets whose uh, work I really love. Uh, so this is really nice. Uh, and thanks, Jess, for that introduction too. Um, I thought I'd start off with, I happen to have a poem called October, so I thought I would start off while we're just entering the month. Um, so this poem is called October. Once I knelt staring in a garden in mid-autumn at the last of the marrow flowers. A pear pushed up out of nowhere overnight, too late for the season. One bent under dew, the frail skin of the other already turning slowly back to water. And yet the leaves bristled in the wind, the tired petals not quite ready to give up to the cold, though each was a distillation of the sun's late colour. And I saw myself kneeling in the garden from far away, caught between one man I no longer love, another I might never. This is how the world turns. Love like a marrow flower closing, like another trying still to open. Um, the collection is in four parts, um, and the second part of it is, a, um, I still not decided what to call it, but it's kind of a translation, uh, invention, um, half 
half from the source material, half from my own uh, imagination of the Middle Irish uh, Sweeney tale. Um, so these poems, I sort of invented little lyric moments or scenes from the tale and told it that way and cut out the narrative bits. Um, but I thought I'd just read you one poem from the end of it, um, which is where uh, Sweeney uh, or Sivna, who I call him, um, is uh, wounded and he makes a confession and uh, I think somehow this is uh, it was written way before um, coronavirus and lockdown but perhaps it, it speaks to this moment a bit more than I had anticipated uh, so this poem is called Swifna is wounded and confesses there was a time when I thought the sound of a dove cooing and flitting over a pond was sweeter than the voices of friends. There was a time when I preferred the blackbird and the boom of a stag belling in a storm. I used to think that the chanting of the mountain grouse at dawn had more music than your voice, but things are different now. Still, it would be hard to say I wouldn't rather live above the bright lake and eat watercress in the wood and be away from sorrow. Um, the book has a, a number of longer poems in it. Um, and I know that's terribly off-putting, uh, especially during a reading, but I hope um, I might just read one of them. Um, which comes right at the start of the collection. It's the third poem in the collection. Um, I don't think you need any information about it apart from um, apart from the title, perhaps. Uh, it's called Dryad, um, which is the name of a, uh, a sort of uh, woodland um, spirit uh, in Greek mythology. Um, so there's a statue, a carved wooden statue, uh, that the poem revolves around. Um, who is the dryad of the title. Dryad. I remember her covered in snow, in a field where each dead stalk of wild flower was thick with frost. The sky was pink in the hawthorns, the day held on the light edge of breaking. A woman carved from the bowl of an oak her feet, if she had any, buried in the winter's shedding weight. Whoever had turned her from the tree had given her an orb, which she held in both hands, close to the gentle curve of her face. And she stood there by the half-rotten stile off Broad Lane, head bowed, as though waiting to greet us and offer the frozen circumference of a new world. Years ago, our school had planted the woods behind her when I was eight or nine, and now each tree ages alongside us. Every time I go back, I see a part of my life laid out still growing in a field by the old village. And I used to come here often at 18 or so, with men at night, and it was strange to pass her as we stumbled in the undergrowth and into the woods like deer plummeting through the wet branches. And I think now of all the men forced outside after clearing out, into the dark spaces of towns, how they walk in vigil to woodlands and old estates, to the smell of the day settling. Once I came here with a man whose whole body was muscled, as though he too had been carved from a single trunk of wood. I pretended all the time to be a man like him, answering each lie in a deep, alien voice. I think I was afraid he would kill me, and walked a few steps ahead, hearing him moving through the sodden grass, 
pulling his feet from the bramble vines. We passed the woman without comment, though she stood there in her cloak of wood, the globe held in the lathed green of her hands. Here was so unlike the places other people went, a place without doors or walls or rooms. The black, heavy-leafed branches pulled back like a curtain, and inside a dark chamber of the wood, guarded and made safe. The bed was the bed of all the plants and trees, and we could share it. And then the kneeling down in front of him, keeping my secrets still in the folds of night, trying not to shake in the cold, and the damp floor seeping up. I remember the cold water spreading in the capillaries of my jeans. As I looked up, the sky hidden under a rain of leaves, each tree stood over me in perfect symmetry with his body. Each was like a man with his head bent, each watching and moving and making slow laboured sighs. And I came back often, year on year, kneeling and being knelt for in acts of secret worship. And now each woodland smells quietly of sex, not only when the air is thick with it, but in winter too, when the strains are grounded and held against the earth. And each time I half expect to meet someone among the trees, or inside the empty skeleton of the rhododendron. And I wonder if I have ruined these places for myself, if I have brought each secret to them and weighed the trees with things I can no longer bear. But then I think, what is a tree or a plant, if not an act of kneeling to the earth, a way of bidding the water to move? of taking in the mouth the inner part of the world and coaxing it out. Not just the aching leaf buds dripping in spring, the cloud of pollen, or in autumn the children knocking branches for the shower of seed, but the people who kneel in the woods at night, the woman waiting by the gate, offering to each visitor a small portion of the world in which they might work for the life of it. Okay, I'll just do one last shorter poem to finish. Uh, thanks for, for listening. Um, this poem, I had to add a, an epigraph at the um, top because I kept on sending it out to journals and, um, well, uh, I sent it out anonymously and, and everyone thought I was a, a woman. Um, so, uh, and that was not a problem, but it was just a surprise. Uh, so I had to add, after the birth of my nephew. So this is um, Ilex, after the birth of my nephew. Distracting myself, waiting for news. I walked until I saw this white cluster of holly growing at the base of a tree. The stems yellowed, the angled clutch of leaves like a bleached coral, a pale antler, almost medieval, like a relic unearthing in the gloom of the wood. Later, still the baby would not latch, and I came back to this holly, unhardened by the sun, unable to turn the light into strength. May it keep its whiteness. May it never learn the use of spikes. Or in time, when a crown is made of it, may the people approach one by one to witness how a fragile thing is raised. Thank you. 
Thank you so much for that, Sean. A really immersive and tactile experience hearing you read those beautiful poems. Thank you so much for sharing them with us. Um, and now I'd love to introduce our third reader, Linda McKenna, who is originally from Concealy in North Dublin, but has lived in County Down for over 20 years now. She began writing poetry only in 2016, and since then has had poems published in a number of publications, including Cranog, The Honest Ulsterman, The North, Poetry Ireland Review, and she won the Seamus Heaney Award for New Writing and the Redline Festival. Poetry Award in 2018. Her debut collection in the Museum of Misremembered Things was published by Dura Press in March of this year. Um, and I think Linda is going to read us a few poems from this wonderful uh, debut. And these are poems that weave uh, such a rich historical tapestry, reclaiming the lives of historical women, and also catalogues the importance of the titles Misremembered Things, a lot of wonderful historical ephemera which really grip the reader. So Linda, please read us a couple of poems. Thanks very much, Jessica, and thanks to everybody at Redline for asking me to do this and to be in such great company. I didn't think I'd be in such amazing company, so thank you very much. I'm actually going to start with this poem, Unsettled, which won the Redline Festival in 2018. And it seems strange to think that, you know, I read this at the Civic Theatre in front of people, um, uh, which hopefully we'll, we'll get back to. And I also remember, even though it was mid-October, it was a really, really warm night, you know, really, really hot and humid um, in the theatre. So I'll start with Unsettled. Unsettled. The builders swear the cracks are settlement, will settle, may even in time close. They don't. Widening, they let in wraiths of grand duchesses, demanding to be fed on eggs and cream, fattened back to dimples. Their gloves never white enough. They throw off the crazy pieced patchwork, bruise themselves on makeshift fences, scratch themselves on young hedges, having never known unwrapped corners, thorns, hidden tree stumps. In the Daldorf Asylum, Clara Poithart is reading a map of silver scars. Elsewhere, a boy cuts himself to prove he cannot stop bleeding. Every day, plaster crumbles under nervous fingers. Every day, more visible, the rag stuffed wattle daub. Um, when I started writing, I had the idea that I might write a collection of um, poems about pairs of sisters. And that didn't survive. A few, a few poems made, made their way into the collection, but that general idea, I, I, I didn't, didn't survive. Um, but I want to read a couple of poems which are based around Ismene, who is the sister of, of Antigone. And Ismene is always presented as being not Antigone, which to my way of thinking is actually perfectly good <laughs> and right thing to be. So these are, these are two poems uh, about Ismene. So this is Ismene aside. Ismene aside. The city is swayed by words, cries over the barefoot, sunburnt girl, takes up its quill, changes the chorus, and this is where I will be buried, a footnote, small printed quibble, briefly dragging the eye to the bottom of the page, intruding on the principal action, a what if, on the other hand, or lesser view, hanging dismissible, over the page where you, my always spotlit sister, are centred, weaving golden circles of words with the skill other girls loop ribbons, twist wool, wool, wool. The lines following on from each other, a pattern we have to follow to the end, then go back and read again, then say out loud the words individual pieces of bright glass dropping onto the stage glowing where they fall, singing in our heads on the street. So we repeat them as vows, as ritual. Behind the curtain, I sweep up the dust, wonder how will we live now? Ismene heads north, where girls sewn into wolf skin paint red through the forest. In the long night time, she pays the gods their due, swallows black bread and herring, prays a litany of save us. The summer days she keeps for herself, eats sun-warmed raspberries, watches the dust motes swirl heedlessly to the ground, dreams of witches and woodcutters whose axes slice through stone and bone, 
entrails and ice, dragging bloody mouthed princesses reluctantly to life. Um, some of the poems in this collection are inspired by um, uh, uh, the work of um, Walter Harris, who wrote a survey of the county down in 1744, um, and it's it's a really amazing amazing work. Um, and I just took a lot of little incidents and events in that book, and some of the language from it as well, um, as, as inspiration for some of these poems. So these two poems are based around the idea of juries of matrons. And if you don't know what juries of matrons are, look them up. They're they're, they're really really interesting. But basically, uh, women who are called on to judge. Um, whether a woman was pregnant or not, and if she was pregnant, she, she could um, be reprieved from being ha from being hanged. But they also judged um, the um, in civil courts in the matters of divorces and annulments. So they had a lot of power. Um, they had the power of life and death, and they also had the power to put asunder what no man um, should be able to do. Uh, in, in other words, marriage. So these two poems are, are about that. A weighing, one intact. As discreet as justice herself, as blind, using only the skill of her hands on the secret parts of the property, we affirm the property to be intact, can pass to better husbanding. The land in acres, roods and perches, fields ploughed and in grass, sheep and the hundred weights of wool in bales. The leases with their the bright clots of sealing wax, the rental income from houses and shops, the plantation possessions, male, female, child, and the female with child, what's out at sea or if at the bottom well insured, and the personal paraphernalia held in trust by the property, necklaces, bracelets, rings, with the exception of the one mistakenly called a wedding ring. Two, reprieve. Don't say strawberries, green apples, cress. Say mulberries, cherries, chalk and coals. Don't say flutter or feather, for any stomach may flutter with fear, any heart feather with hope. Say wings, not the delicate lace wing of the finch or the wren, but the ragged dirt spattered wing of gull, pigeon or crow. Say beat, even drum beat, and above all say settle. The rough, ragged, ragged wings have beaten and clattered the way past your ribs. Now they fold and settle. The quick child slows to fatten and float, contemplate her new soul, the soul pledge of her mother. Um, I'll, I'll read uh, this poem here, which is annexed, um, which again is inspired by Walter Harris's um, Ancient and Present State of the County of Down. Annexed, then dispositions like diseases were heritable. We lived among the notional and flighty, those who wore their hand-me-down bad luck easily, and the gifted tea-leaf readers, predictors of rain, the early riser waking us for the hollyhead boat, the wheel of fortune spinner without whom no garden fate could start, the man who docked the tails of all our pups, in their mouths a world of dying words, speckless, tay, conacre. Sometimes I try them out, nostalgia, faint echo, something false. Here is a coat with not a brack on it, and that drunk outside Starbucks look at the slew of him. Um, I. Uh, wrote some poems, um, I read some poems recently from my father because he was 80 um, and, and he's heard that. So I thought I'd read this poem from my sister um, and it's called Middle Child. Perfect in the perfect place you always find. You float effortlessly, as symmetrical as a star, as skillful as a silver fish that is really a princess. Suspended in the waves, as if caught by the silken ropes the pantomime fairy flies on, we underneath, gaping at her skill, her daring. But yours is no illusion, just another of the easy accomplishments you offer to us who bookend you, begin and end but never complete you. 
We, striking out for the white waves beyond the warning signs, swimming on until we are rescued, salty and scarred and sobbing, or carrying at the edge where the sand clings and clogs like mud, sunburnt flesh stinging, unblessed by the weightless healing sea, never recognising the middle for what it is, not too hot or too cold, not too big or too small, the just right where all fairy tale sisters should live. Um, and uh, carrying on the theme, I'll, I'll read Not Brothers. Um, and this poem was, was uh, came about because um, in the period between Christmas and New Year, when you're really searching for something to watch on television, and you're, you know, you're, you, you really should be out and about, but you're sitting in the house. I watched a, a PBS documentary about Billy the Kid. <laughs> so this is about Billy the Kid. Um, Not Brothers. Late at night, the Old West dusts off its sepia heroes and villains. And I discover that Billy the Kid was not the youngest brother of Frank and Jesse James, did not die in a gunfight at the OK Corral as the boys in our school played. Tarnished guns and homemade holsters, they open their veins with compasses and penknives, pressed the delicate pale wrists together, swore allegiance forever, until the next week when a new loyalty unpicked the scabs and eventually they were all blood brothers. We envied this game, already knowing our undying loves would be undone by differently shed blood, the drape of veil, garlands of rose and milk and milk. Um, <clears throat> I'll read these last two poems for my son who is away at university. Um, and this is for my son, a weather eye. On the way home, the weather changes. The wind hums a faint Sunday hymn. And in the small hotel behind green corrugated sheds, there is a wedding. Who gets married on a Sunday evening so far from anywhere but the road to and from the ferry? We can see the bride. The guests are middle-aged, heavy set. The women, bulk balanced on kitten heels, are in flower dresses made for the young, the slim. They belong in heavy coats, heather mixed with gleaming buttons, should carry handbags whose leaves, foxes, glassier mints. They look like ants, perhaps they are, the unseed bride, slip of a girl, a dead sister's child, the flighty one, wearing a dress they picked out launched into married life on this windy night to a bridegroom they picked out, solid like them, ballast to stop her drifting out to sea. And here on the ferry road, miles from where I've left my son, beginning a different life, I want to beg of them to keep on him a weather eye. Um, and this last one is, uh, I don't know if you've been to Ackle Island and the um, the Bully village where the houses are, there's lots and lots of houses in ruins up on the hill. And I would have brought my son and my nieces and nephews there and they loved uh, running up there and picking out their, their house um, every year. So this is Bully House. Step on step, on lintel balance. Under your thin summer shoes, those bumps are hearthstones, thresholds sinking further every year. Soon you will be taller than their doors, their gable ends, then past the game of choosing the highest house with the best view over the sea, the shrinking fields, the dots of sheep, the one with the widest windowsill, a worn smooth groove where you lie and imagine their climb to the sweeter grass, nearer the sun, warming cold bones, greening their winter world, free from scouring, hoarding. Who cares about dust in summer dwellings, gaps in doorways, loose panes of glass, smoking chimneys, empty sacks? And I will learn to make that summer ascent, live in seasons, divide my world into you're going away, you're coming back. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Lovely. Thank you so much for that, Linda. Just a gorgeous reading um, from a book which has so many
history and family life all woven together in such a fascinating way. Um, and it's just been lovely to listen to the three of you. And it's got me thinking a little bit, a bit about the notion of how uh, I think that for most of us in the past couple of months, time has kind of bent and stretched and flexed in unusual ways. Um, and I think if you were to ask many of us, give many of us a quick fire round and say, what date is it? We might all say the 18th of March because, you know, <laughs> life is in such strange ways um, and and Kerry I'd love to come to you first because one of the things that I really enjoyed um, tangling with in Where Now Begins is the way that you deal with the concept of time in the collection um, and again it's a beautiful earthy tactile collection but it has this fantastic kind of conceptual exploration of ideas of time and time passing um, of ideas of memory in the, the wonderful poem Shopping that you read us and um, but also for me one of the kind of revelatory lines in the collection was in the the, the poem talking to my stepson and um, where we have the line what's done is done forever and there seems to be a really with the moment the idea of um the fact that once something is done it's it's done and and we can cause these very small damages within our lives that can't be undone and um, can you talk to me a little bit about you how you've approached the idea of time in the collection I don't think I approach it. I'm, I think it's just part of the way I see life. I think that um, we are always moving through life, so we are always leaving something behind and moving towards something else. So it is necessarily transitory. Everything we do is transitory. And there is always loss because there is always that which we had and no longer have. And there is always that which is ahead and we have not yet reached. So there wasn't, there wasn't a conscious um, decision as to how to approach time. I'm not that sort of writer. I write very... Um, I write what is in front of me. I don't. I don't sort of think out a thesis and then do it. I'm. I'm much more an instinctive, an instinctual writer than that. And um, I think that. I don't think poetry is journalism. I think it's very far from journalism. And I think that we should not be asked to be journalists. I think we are. Is I think what we're doing is. We are trying to approach a secret, and the secret is something which is life itself. Never, we never can put our fingers on it because it is impossible to put your fingers on it. But sometimes it comes closer, and sometimes it recedes. And I think that in in an odd way, in the winter, the secret becomes more visible, and then it becomes more invisible again as the year progresses and everything starts happening and everything is, is rushing to happen and then it all goes away again. Yes, it does is. Does that make at all? Absolutely, no, it does. And I think that, as I said at the very beginning of this, I think a lot of the poems we're hearing today uh, really connect to that notion of this moment in time in the year when it does feel like some kind of a veil is, is briefly drawn aside and we become closer to a different side of, of the nature that's around us. Um, which, which brings me on to, to your work, Sean, which is you know, as I said earlier, deeply engaged with nature, but I feel like it's a very refreshing approach to nature that you take. This is a, 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 a beautiful nature, but it's also a nature that has violence, it has sexuality, and it has a kind of an earthy, an earthiness and a realness to it, which sometimes we, we don't necessarily see in the lyric poem. Um, and, you know, like with Kerry's collection, there are a lot of October poems, there are a lot of autumn poems where I think we see nature with its prettiness stripped back to some extent and can you tell us a little bit about how nature inspires your work? Yeah um, I think it's interesting to, to listen to Carrie there as well because I think 
I probably approach things in a in a similar way in that um so without speaking for Carrie but for me they're often subconscious and it's only after I've written the poem or in this case even the collection that I realized I was writing a lot about certain things um and it just so it became a record of the way that I was thinking rather than being a conscious attempt to look at something um so in some ways it's strange to go back and realize that these are poems that deal with sexuality alongside nature or, or uh, death alongside nature because it wasn't like I was setting out to explore those things um, consciously. Um, I suppose the way that I work um, is usually by taking something from the outside world and waiting for it to match or to say something about something in the inner world or something that I can't see or visualize or something. Um, so often I find that nature perhaps gives me an external or physical form uh, through which I can connect with something else in my life. And that's where the poem comes from. Um, and if I uh, try to write a poem that's just about nature, I often find that the poem fails because it's not connected. It's not sparking with something else. Um, so if I take one or the other side of me, um, the natural world or something personal on their own, they don't make a poem. Uh, and I find I have to combine those two things to make something. Um, so in that way, I find nature to be a really inspiring stock of ever changing images and forms. And if I look closely at it, um, or if I think about it enough, it will spark something else inside me. Um, so uh, yeah, I'm very grateful to it. <laughs> um, yeah, but I think you really see that, I mean, in poems like uh, St. John's Wort, where you have this wonderful kind of progression from the, the image of the plant to the, the image of holding the person's head in your hands. And um, I think I think really, uh, I think that's a wonderful example of that journey that you talk about, about how we conflate these two ideas and they can give us really, really rich subject matter. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Sean. And uh, Linda, moving on to, to your work, um, I mean, I just... So enjoy your your what I what I find and I always mean this is a compliment your historian's approach <laughs> to the work you know and that you've gathered so many of these intriguing details um, and as I said these little kind of historical ephemera and um, but I'd love to start I know you said to, to us to go and look up the ancient and the present state of uh, County Down and I know that these were written about a number of different counties but can you can you tell us how you first came across this work and how it uh, began to inspire a number of the poems in the Museum of Misremembered Things? Well, I actually work, I work in a museum, so I work in Down County Museum. So we would have used that book for various things that we do in the museum. Um, and then I just happened to pick it up and start reading it as an actual book, uh, you know, uh, last last year, sometime or the year, year before. And I, I think it's the language that I'm fascinated by more than the actual history. Historical detail. So I, I just love the words. I just love the, the concept of the different kinds of words that that Walter Harris, um, you know, you know, uses. And I think the other thing is that although he wrote different surveys of different counties of Ireland, there's actually quite a lot of similarity between North County Dublin and County Down. Um, well, certainly that's what that's what I feel as somebody who, who, who's lived in both in both areas. Um, and I just love the love the fact that as well that when he comes to the very end, he leaves a very very short number of pages. There's only a small number of pages to deal with people because he spent you know, pages and pages talk, talking about fish and birds and all kinds of things and he goes on to talk about people but even though he says he's going to look at the achievements of the, so the great men of the of the of the, the county he actually talks about people who just lived for a very very long time or people who were born you know he talks about you know people who are either very very small or very very big or the woman who had quadruplets so he doesn't actually talk about the great men at all he just talks about ordinary people and find little stories about strange people that he's come across and I really and I really liked that but I also like the fact that within that book you can see in the margins the other people because he talks about how you know society would be improved if we all do x y and z so he's a big fan of charter schools for instance um and he doesn't see but he doesn't realize that behind these charter schools are the people who don't get to go to any school at all so it's kind of interesting what he misses as well and you can kind of work in there and you know use your imagination to populate the the pages that he's not populating with with your own things. I actually have a mind full of all kinds of 
ephemera. I'm sort of one of those snapper up of unconsidered trifles. Um, so my mind's full of full of uh, things that aren't, you know, um, that a lot of other people wouldn't think would be very important. And I do like to use that in poetry. I sometimes think that, um, you know, you come across such weird and wonderful things that they absolutely demand and deserve a poem. Um, so, yeah, I, I, I just like to have all those kind of different bits of historical information in there. I think as well that, you know, I'm probably that, you know, one of the, the, the last generation really of people who lived much, you know, fairly similar lives to their mothers and their grandmothers. The, the, the difference between my life and my son, my nieces and nephews' lives is huge. Or it's different between my, my life and my mother's life and my grandmother's life is not that big, really, in terms of what we did as children and how we played and, and all those kind of expectations. And there's been some sort of huge sea change, I think, between my generation and the succeeding generations that wasn't, you know, wasn't there. So, you know, I could have quite easily lived 200 years ago, but, at the, you know, to, to live as a young person now, I think would be very difficult, very different, very difficult and demanding. So, um, yeah, I think that, you know, that there's a lot of continuity, obviously, in, in where we live as well. Yeah, and I, I love the notion of that. Absolutely, but I love the notion of that kind of almanac style approach to history as well. And and, and I sometimes, yeah. as you say, the things that are included really highlight the things that get left out, um, yes. uh, which is such an interesting, uh, it's such an interesting dynamic. Um, and I think in all three collections, there's a really interesting approach to, to history. Um, but also, I think we find, and again, with collections that feel kind of autumnal in their nature, there's often a strand of, of elegy. And Kerry, I'd love to turn to you and ask you to talk a little bit about some of the some of the elegy in the book. Um, there's one poem in particular that really spoke to me, which is which is Eel Speak for, for Kieran Carson, um, who's the anniversary whose death is coming up this month, actually. I think it, it may even be the day that we're recording today. Um, but what I really loved about this elegy is its is its warmth, its wryness, uh, its its sense of capturing Kieran's personality. Can you talk to us a little bit about that? Yes, um, I worked with Kieran in the arts council of Northern Ireland for some years. Um, and he was a friend, so 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 when I first when I knew Kieran, he was the traditional arts officer. Michael Longley was the um, was the literature officer, and Kieran nobody nobody thought of Kieran as a as a writer. He was, as far as we knew, he didn't write. He was a musician, and um, his wife was Deirdre is a musician, and. Um, and also, Kieran had a terrible stutter. I don't think a lot of people realise that now. So it was almost as if he could only talk when he got drunk. So um, a lot of my conversations with Kieran were in bars when he was drunk, because otherwise you couldn't make out what he was saying. And I think that comes into the into the poem because. I mean, it starts off on the banks of the barrow, watching the... Somebody said to me, the poles have the river fished out, you know, complaining that the... Po because we get a lot of Eastern Europeans fishing here, because especially at the start of the Celtic Tiger, they, they didn't have families, so they were... They were and, um, and Kieran, when I first met him, was also a lonely man. But mm. as... His, as his, his, um, he suddenly emerged as a, as a writer as well, as a, and, and in fact the writing completely took over from, took over the, the musician, he never stopped playing music, but he, he became much more of a writer than a musician. And he used to play in his readings. But in Kieran's early readings, I mean, you would be sitting there in the audience saying, just, do you know the way people who stutter try and get past the first word? And you would be sitting there in the audience thinking, please, God, let him get past that first word and on to the wow. next one. So, mm -hmm. so the poem was written with huge affection um, because, as I said, we, when, the, when I, I'm up as a few, a couple of years ago, and he said to me, he looked at me and he said, you know, I was always in love with your sister, but I never had the nerve to tell her. <laughs> and and it, it all that, all that, 
history that at 25 he would never have told me but at the ages we were I mean he was only he's only two years older than me um, we could talk about is that there are there are there is great freedom in age as well as great loss um, we could we, we could and, and of course the intensity of living through the troubles as well that always comes into it because oh, they're much more intense and when somebody was the life's been hard for the young now. I don't think they're hard for the young now. I don't think we didn't we didn't we didn't not go out because you might a bomb might. Go, I mean, I I I really ask questions about all this COVID policy. Yeah, um, and I think you really in the in the image of the eel. I think you capture something wonderful about about that language and that speech that you talk about, but also something about about Kieran as a kind of a, a, a an incredibly reticent at times but independent character. Um, and I just thought it was a it was a wonderful testament to the man. Um, and you also have a wonderful a wonderful I would call it an ode to 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 Michael and Edna Longley as well, which is so fond and so beautifully captures um those two people as a as a, as a couple um, and it feels i think to the reader um very very generous of you as a writer to allow us into that wonderful dynamic and all of that history that you you spoke about just there um which many of us as readers will have a sense of but um there's a wonderful intimacy to it and a wonderful generosity to it as well um Sean, I'd love to turn to you now and, and ask you a little bit about some of the some of the kind of intertextual references in the collection in Tongues of Fire. Um, uh, I, I love the the Willisovna sequence, um, and I just I just think it's really refreshing to see a new approach to this work, which is something that crops up once in a while, I think, in the Irish poetic tradition. But it feels to me a little bit in the book like there's a kind of a conversation with Seamus Heaney going on, um, both in the Willis Swivna sequence and also in the old Croc and Man, whereby I think you as writer imagine yourself into this fog body in, and inhabit it in a, in a totally different way. Um, and did you find yourself in conversation uh, with that work, with Heaney's work while you were writing? Or again, is it something that you kind of looked back on afterwards? <laughs> It's something that people have commented on a lot, and it's kind of struck me as uh, a surprise. It took me by surprise because I, I, Heaney isn't someone that I have read um, for a long, like seriously for a long time. Um, you know, it would have been school and university, and then I dipped in and out. And uh, he was, he was never, he was certainly wasn't someone that I was looking to for guidance or like a presiding uh, spirit over the collection. Um, but I suppose perhaps uh, that early influence was really important in a way that I hadn't understood. Um, perhaps the way that I think about poetry was really shaped by the very early exposure to, to poetry that I had. So perhaps Heaney uh, shaped the way I look at things more than I, uh, than I think. Um, but with the uh, the bog body poem, it was definitely uh, that was definitely a bit of a a take off. Um, I I thought I was being um, it was the only poem that I I thought I was being quite uh, cheeky with. Uh, I thought it it was one of the last poems that I wrote for the book, and I had um, a bit more confidence because I knew the book was going to come out. Um, so I thought uh, that since I'm writing in this lyric tradition, uh, I might try and take it take it on head on um and put myself inside it so uh i was thinking particularly about um heaney's bog body poems and uh i'd been down to the bog, the bog body exhibition in uh, the national museum and i know thing about um one of the bog bodies and then i was reading up about it um uh, the old croc and man has his nipples cut off um and uh one of the theories is that um that was to uh, to stop him from becoming a king because uh, suckling on a king's nipples was was a sign of uh, submission, so it gave gave them power. Oh, um, <laughs> um, so that was my conscious uh, kind of inserting 
uh, queerness into the lyric canon. Um, and that was the only time I definitely consciously um, was doing that. Um, but once I knew the collection was was in the bag, so to speak, I thought um, I might uh, cheekily uh, take take it on and, and correct it and, uh, and do something um, uh, queer with it because I, I don't see that that has happened so often and it takes a very um, specifically Irish and canonically Irish lyric subject um, and adds a queer voice to it and that was something that I was consciously trying to do which is not something I often do I don't I'm not usually conscious about most of the things that I do um, but yeah yeah that was that was one one example yeah, absolutely. And I think it is important for those dialogues to expand and change. And, you know, I, I'm always intrigued to see writers kind of responding to a tradition and building on it as well. So I think that's just, that's a fantastic thing. And um, you've written on Sing as well, Sean, um, which I'm kind of interested in as with my own background, having worked in theatre. Um, and I think uh, there are some wonderful echoes even within the, the Willis Swivna poems. I think there's a, a wonderful echo in um, Swivna the vis visits Joram of uh, Christy Mahan talking about the women standing in, in their shifts. Uh, there's a wonderful echo of that line. And did you find that your own, your, your studies in the realm of theatre and modernism, have they influenced your poetry writing at all or do you keep the two very separate? I think it's in some ways impossible to keep them separate because they all go into the same brain. Um, so whether I'm conscious of it or not, the more, if I read a lot of sing, the musicality of that language is in my head and I probably like some of the the music of it and subconsciously think that's good music I'll try I'll try that um so uh, yeah which is probably what happened with Heaney as well perhaps uh, the cadences of it probably come through uh, if you spend a lot of time with something um so it probably again probably wasn't a conscious thing although I do uh, occasionally find um I think it came through in the in the Sweeney sequence more because it's quite natural to do an Irish translation and adopt a bit of a Hiberno English syntax or something. Um, so I probably allowed it to come through there in a way that I wouldn't if I was um, doing my own straightforward poem. Um, but yeah, definitely, I think the music is kind of a hard thing to to get rid of once once it's inside uh, your head. Um, I suppose, yeah. Which is which is a wonderful thing, I think, and it's lovely to be able to kind of carry those tunes in a sense. And mm -hmm. um, it brings me on, Linda, to all of the historical details that you were saying are inside your head. <laughs> and one of the things that really took from, from reading your collection is a sense that when it comes to history, the devil really is in the detail. And, and for me, this collection feels like a kind of a testament to the notion that if we are losing, you know, every, every little loss of even the smallest little aspect of history uh, can completely change our understanding of an event. Um, and, you know, the as, as many poems that you read and unsettled, we get these really wonderful uh, brief insights and intimate insights into these historical figures who are kind of often consigned to the footnotes. Um, can you talk to me a little bit about this process of, of reclamation and what it means to you? Yeah, I mean, I suppose, uh, you know, when you work in a museum, you, especially a local museum, you're not working with great, big, um, really, really massively important objects. You're working with griddles and gas masks and, and and very sort of everyday very everyday objects um and i think you know you, we we all have a process of moving i think you know in school we learn the big stories and the heroic stories and how our country was formed and that kind of thing and as you get older i think you obviously you get more an appreciation of how your grandparents lived and very you know ordinary everyday life and i think we're we're losing that. There was a great vogue in the in the 80s and 90s for reclaiming local history and reclaiming um, the everyday and people who ploughed or reaped or women who sowed or those kind of things. And I think one of the things I think I've said before is that with the decade of centenaries, what we've done is we've, we've gone back to those great big stories and we've lost the bulk of history, which is people 
working in fields and winnowing and women doing laundry and we've gone we've gone away from the appreciation of that into the um you know the obsession with the, the heroes and the myths and the, how we, how our country was formed those kind of things and i think what i what i like to do in, in my poems is to go back to those people on the margins and you can find them you can find them in all kinds of strange documents you can find them in small objects you can find them in all kinds of things in your own family stories you can find them but i think we've started to want to lose them which is which is you know we don't want to reclaim those stories anymore because they, because they contradict the the great big myths that we're now that that we're now you know going back to so we don't want to hear you know that my grandmother for instance you know she was almost born as a, as the 20th century dawned uh, you know she had no truck with that kind of heroicness of Pierce and all that kind of stuff she she wanted to talk about you know how when she got her pension what a great thing that was and the sort of pounds shillings and pence and how much things cost and how hard life was and I think that's really important that we go back to that we've definitely we've lost that in the past number of years I think so I think you, you can find that again in poetry in prose and um, in, in, in creative writing and of course what you're also doing in, in poetry is you, you know you, you're not you're writing your own version of their versions of their versions so you have to be very careful to not take what you see in a poem as being what actually happened or, or you know the, the, the truth of a poetry isn't the gospel truth it's not necessarily what actually happened but I think it is interesting to go back and to try and reclaim those people on on the margins you know our, our grandmothers and our great grandmothers um I don't know that I have a very thought out process of, of writing things I tend to get hooked on a word or a phrase at the moment i've got the phrase chance medley going around in my head which is a is a, is a legal term that i found in, in um the old bailey online which is an amazing site go onto the old bailey online you'll find all kinds of really interesting things i don't know what chance medley was but it's it's it keeps it keeps going around in my head i i, I tend to get hooked on phrases and words um, that come out of nowhere and try and write around those um, which sometimes makes 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 it that I it takes me ages to write a poem, um, and I very often abandon the poem I'm writing because it doesn't it doesn't work or doesn't come out to anything. But I do try and write around words um, that I found and phrases. I'm a very slow writer, so it does take me a long time. But yeah, I think it's really important to try and get those people in the margins, more centre mm -hmm. stage. Yeah, and I think as Kerry said at the beginning, you know, we're not journalists and it's not about uh, trying to, to capture fact, but I think what it can do, poetry, is is add to the subtleties and nuances of, of general discourse. And I think that's where people come to yeah. poetry for, for that kind of space to consider. Um, and just to finish off, I'd love to ask the three of you to, to tell me a little bit about, um, I suppose, how your day-to-day -day creativity has been impacted over the last months. How have you managed to, to change your writing routine or have you had to in any way? Have you found that the enforced isolation has given room for insight or has it just been a total pain? Um, either answer is fine. Um, and Kerry, I might come to you first. Well, um, when lockdown happened here, I thought, great, all this time, no visitors, brilliant. I'll get loads of work done. And um, I am amazed at how many people told me, how many writers and artists have told me they've, they've done very little work in this time because the psychic dynamic or whatever has been such that they don't seem to be for for reasons they don't understand and i don't understand um that they don't seem to be able to engage in that way when when i decided i would write one lockdown poem which it actually goes back to a record of the black death in kilkenny um, where it was, Kilkenny was really hard hit because it was very isolated at that time and it had no immunity. And it's, most of the poem is, is the actual words of a friar who died in the, tending other people in the Black Death. And it just ends with unleaving the vellum um, and anybody else who c continues fine. Um, so so that was what I did. And then I found the poems didn't come. So what I've been doing is I've gone back to a novel which was, which is the novel I have been writing, but, and, and somehow the, the actual dynamics of, of what is going on is set in Paris and set in the, in the Second World War because 
I knew a woman who was 18 when the when the Hitler's armies marched into Paris, and um, I found that I found that I'm being I'm I'm going over that and I'm pulling it together much more tightly, but I'm not doing much in the way of original creative work. Yeah, it's, it's, I don't it's know how anyone strange. else feels. Yeah, it's a strange yeah, time. Sean. Yeah, Sean, how have you been getting on? Um, similarly, it sounds. Um, oh. I think it, it sounds a little bit like it feels to me as if at once everything is happening and nothing is happening, and I find that a really. Um, I feel like I'm stuck in the middle, um, yeah. where it feels almost like. Um, perhaps I should write about lockdown or coronavirus, but I don't know how because it's. But I don't know what's going on most of the time, and I'm as confused as everyone else. Um, and at the same time, every day is basically the same, and my stimulation is very <laughs> low. Uh, as in, it's just walking around the same bits of park, doing work, and you know, like calling friends. Um, so I found that I haven't done much in the way of, of poetry and I've tried and I know better now than to wrangle a poem that's not going to work anyway. Mm. Um, and, and I think it's also strange um, because I published the book in April, so just at the start of lockdown. So there was that big uh, clearing out of the mental closet that happens when you get rid of a book and so I was left with no poems to begin with. So it was a strange thing uh, to have all my poems gone and then also just be stuck thinking, what now? Um, so I found it strange, although like Kerry, I've uh, found that prose has been a little bit easier. So I've been writing a prose book um, more recently and I found it easier to get... Um, or well, the mechanics of it are perhaps a little bit easier to do as a task, uh, I found. So I can write a paragraph um, and I can try and describe one thing or figure out something about the structure and it feels a little bit more practical, perhaps. Um, whereas for me, a poem tends to catch me unawares and uh, one have caught me <laughs> yet. Uh, so um, yeah. Yeah. It's funny, lockdown does feel a little bit like being in an indefinite writer's retreat where nobody's cooking you dinner. Um, and you know, I, I often find no it one's doing any work. <laughs> doing any work. Dinner, you're not looking out over the lovely lake in Anna McCarrick. You know? um, it, it's, it's a funny thing because I, I find the same thing, actually, Sean and Kerry, that I, I find often when I have a lot of time, the poems will just not arrive, whereas some, there's something about the structured nature of prose where you feel like you can, even if, you're, if, even if you know you're probably not doing your best work, at least there is something that you can have a plan of attack uh, towards or, you know, kind of have some sort of strategy about, um, whereas uh, the poems do not come unbidden a lot of the time. And what about you, Linda? You, you, has your museum been closed as well? Have yes. You stuck a I'm only back to work this week, so I was furloughed for quite a while. So originally thinking, great, get loads of writing done. <laughs> but like Sean and Kerry, that, that didn't work. I did, I uh, wrote one lockdown poem at the very beginning uh, for the pandemic.ie site. Um, and I gathered together some of my thoughts around a second collection, which is really a very grand way of saying a bit, a bit more writing. So I've been gathering thoughts and looking up things and reading, but not doing very much writing. I started again recently I did, I did do some online courses over the summer so uh, they sort of kept me going and I find I can write a little bit after I've done a course I can normally write a little bit not not a, not a huge amount but so I've got I've got start writing again but it's, it's it is quite recent I spent most of lockdown walking or watching Netflix or or doing my son was home for the summer so so we did a lot of walking which was good I, I have got ideas for, for things but they haven't they haven't got very formulated I have actually started to write a poem called the bench in lockdown or the bench behind closed doors which is about the new football benches that we have now so we don't have a bench in football anymore we have the players scattered around the stadium so I'm doing a poem about that <laughs> so that that yeah but again not much writing but hopefully a lot of ideas that may come to something in the next few months oh, well, I'm glad yeah, I think it's just a very strange time yeah 
Yeah, yeah. I think we've all had to become, uh, I, for one, have become aware by how brainwashed I've been by the notion of productivity, you know, mm. and I think we all think as writers that we're kind of immune to that and we're aware that we're working on a slightly mm. different time scale. But suddenly when this great gulf of empty space and time opens up before you, you really do feel the need to achieve something, uh, yeah. which I think is anti-creativity <laughs> in any case. Um, but listen, I've so enjoyed talking to the three of you. I'd like to thank you so much for sharing your poems. Um, Kerry Hardy, Sean Hughes and Linda McKenna, thank you so much for giving us your time um, and your wonderful words. And again, I'd like to finish by encouraging all of our viewers to go out and buy the books and to attend many more events at the wonderful Redline Book Festival 2020. Thank you. Thank you.